Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this, the fifth Sunday of Easter. It is good to be with you all this morning. Just a few announcements for today. This week, um, tonight, at the calendar, um, there is women's Bible study at 6.30 p.m. It should be a beautiful night for that. It's going to be, they're going to be meeting, the women are going to be meeting out at Valley Hope Farm. It is not supposed to rain. It is supposed to be nice and warm, so please do uh, come out to Valley Ho Farms at 6.30 p.m. Tomorrow is our Hope to Faith Ministries. Um, uh, this is a group of people that um, get together who have experienced loss over the years, just kind of to gather for a meal and for holy conversation. They're going to be meeting at Tapia's tomorrow at 3 o'clock for a late lunch, early dinner. On Thursday, there's a bunch of things happening. There is handbell rehearsal and choir rehearsal, uh, 6 and 7.15. There's also a uh, table talk that night. We're going to be meeting at Verona's because main cup was not available. Uh, we are talking about at table talk this week. Um, what is the word of God according to Luther and the other reformers? Uh, so that is 6 p.m. at Verona's this week. Next Sunday, we have our last confirmation class of the school year, followed by youth group at 6 p.m. Some other things to look forward to in May, we have the Lady Spring Fling on May 8th. Um, tickets are still available for that. They're doing a paint night with that, and you might think, well, I'm not an artist, I, I shouldn't come. Nonsense. Th these paint nights are really cool. They, um, they s somehow teach you how to paint a whole painting and, uh, to people who have never held a paintbrush in their life, and you, it's really kind of a neat thing. So um, that is May 8th. Um, there's also going to be some uh, finger painting activity for the kids that my wife and uh, Pastor Nyan and uh, Kaylin are going to be doing too. We do need some help in the kitchen and with servers at night, so if you're able to help out with that at all, please um, let Shirley or Deb or the church office know. Coming up in um, on May 14th, there's a day off of school because it's the primary election day in Maryland. Um, we are going to uh, Christ Lutheran uh, Church in, the, in Baltimore to uh, check out some of the really neat ministries that they're doing down there that they're a part of and then in the afternoon we're going to go over to the Maryland Zoo. We do like to know by May 1st how many people are going just so that uh, we can have a rough estimate. Um, it, the event is free so please um, let me and it's also for elementary, middle, and high schoolers for that. So that is coming up um, May 14th. There's also a bunch of information here about Vacation Bible School coming up in July, um, more about that in the coming weeks. Um, if you haven't picked up a copy of your beacon, uh, you can grab a copy in, on the end of your pews, or if you don't see one at the end of your pews, there's a bunch around the church. Please do pick a copy up. Um, check it out. There's a lot of great information there about all the upcoming events and ministries uh, this summer, and also um, some really good articles for you to check out as well in there. One thing, too, uh, on May 2nd is the National Day of Prayer. We have ordered some of these pamphlets. They have some prayers in there to help guide you that day on your prayer. Um, you can pick them up um, on the table as you leave today um, and join in that National Day of Prayer on May 2nd. Are there any other announcements or prayer requests? We did get word that uh, Dick Greenwalt is um, not doing too good on hospice care, so we want to keep Dick in our prayers, especially this day. Um, we also, um, one thing to celebrate is uh, today is Baptism Palooza. We had two baptisms at the first service, and we have two baptisms today at this service. Uh, so Murphy and Cameron were baptized this morning, and Iona and Carson are going to be baptized at this service, which is just awesome. So um, we are so delighted that the Holy Spirit is moving it in the church this way. Um, and what's even more exciting is none of them are my kids. So um, <laughs> when, um, that is just great. So um, let us uh, continue with the prelude.
invite you all to stand for confession and forgiveness. We begin in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, our desires are and from no secret circuit, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess us in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown things we have done, and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you, and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, has been given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing your opening hymn, 377.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, you give us your Son as the vine apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Good morning. 
Today's reading is, starts with chapter 8 of Acts, starting with verse 26 through 40. Led by the Spirit, Philip encounters an Ethiopian official who is returning to his African home after having been to Jerusalem to worship. Philip uses this, their encounter to proclaim the gospel to him. Upon coming to faith in Jesus, he is baptized by Philip. <laughs> An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was like this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the, commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. We will now read from Psalm 22 responsibly. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The Lord shall be All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow, shall bow before God. For the dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down in the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you, 
abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You all may be seated. I have long lamented that the only time of the year that we get to hear from the book of Acts is in the season of Easter. Because the book of Acts was written during a time and describes a time when the church did ministry in a post-resurrection, pre-Christendom world. And now as we live 2,000 years later in a post-resurrection but post-Christendom world, I think there's a lot of wisdom that we can gain as a church from this book of how to do ministry today. The passage from our first lesson today is really part of a larger narrative that goes all the way back to chapter 6. And so in order really to understand the impact of chapter 8, we need to turn back a few pages. In Acts 6, we hear about a problem the early church was facing. The apostles are busy because the church is growing in Jerusalem by leaps and bounds. And you'll remember that one of the new things that converts were doing to Christianity was that they were selling all their possessions and giving the proceeds of that sale to the church. Which meant that these new devotees were now dependent upon the church to provide for their daily needs. Not only do the apostles need to worry about the Sunday morning sermon, they also need to make sure that Joe and Karen and, and their three boys, their three kids, have a place to sleep, food to eat, and clothes to wear. What was not absent from the early Christian church was sin and total depravity to sin. This meant that the distribution of food, water, and shelter were not always distributed fairly or equally. Because those at the top, being sinners, weren't good at sharing, just like we are today. And they especially weren't people who were good at sharing with people they weren't normally accustomed to sharing with. In Acts 6, we hear the problem of the Hellenist Jew, Jewish converts complaining against the Hebrew Jewish converts because the Hellenists felt like their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. Now, I like to say that we've moved past these, these trivial type of minor disputes in the church, but that would be a lie. I, I deal with these kinds of issues all the time. One group of people in the church has a problem with another group of people at the church, and they turn to the pastors to mediate the dispute. The Hellenists, who were, who were Jewish, but because of the diaspora, they moved away from the temple and, and um, developed their own religious traditions. And uh, you think like Lutherans and Presbyterians were all Christian, but if you go to a Presbyterian church, it's very different worship than what you would get here on a Sunday morning. For years, these, these two groups of people, the Hellenists and the Hebrews, they, they never really associated together. But now because of their conversion to Christianity, they're now brought into community with one another and have to live together. I'm sure this isn't the first dispute that the church was facing that arose in the church between two different ethnic groups, but it is the first kind, the first kind of dispute that Luke actually writes down for us. The apostles have to fix this problem. And so the apostles' solution to the problem with food distribution is to have someone else take care of it, right? Which is like the greatest thing in the world. Like that's what pastors do today a lot. Like you got a problem, okay, I'm at a point. Since you have the problem, you, here's, you're going to fix it for me, right? They, they say, according to the book of Acts, it is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of spirit and wisdom, whom they may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and serving the word. This, seem, this compromise seems to make everyone happy in the community. And so they elect seven deacons to serve the tables. The apostles pray and lay their hands on them to make them official. And their whole mission as deacons is to tend to the table and make sure that nobody goes hungry. That's it. That's all they have to do. Tend to the tables in this growing community. The apostles will handle the preaching, and the deacons will handle the table. But that arrangement doesn't last long at all. Stephen, who was elected a deacon, seems to go rogue. He starts doing what the apostles are doing. He's preaching. 
as well as doing other great wonders and signs among the people. And one day, Stephen is in the local synagogue, and he gets into a fight, an argument with the local synagogue officials. Stephen doesn't back down from this fight and spends the entirety of chapter 7 laying out how Jesus had been a part of God's plan from the very beginning. And he concludes his speech by saying, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised and hearts and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of your prophets did your ancestors not persecute? Needless to say, Stephen's speech here in, in Acts chapter 7 doesn't make him any friends in the sin God that day. In fact, it angers the leadership so much that they drag him outside and stone him to death. The killing of St. Stephen started a diaspora of sorts in the church. The death of Stephen emboldened people like Saul to persecute the church and its members. The community that the apostles were building was now under attack, and many of those in the community fled the Jerusalem church for safety. You know, Acts is not all that clear about what happens to the other five deacons if they stay in Jerusalem or not. It, most likely they, they stayed, but remember there were seven elected. Stephen died, there's five, so we have one more. There's another deacon who Luke talks about here in the book of Acts, and his name is Philip, that Bob read to us about today. Luke tells us that Philip leaves Jerusalem after Stephen is killed, and he decides to go to a very strange place, Samaria. This is a place that was off limits to most Jewish people. Perhaps he goes to Samaria because he knows people like Saul won't dare follow him to Samaria and risk defilement. Jesus does, though, predict that the church would one day spread the good news to Samaria. So it sort of makes sense that Philip goes there. In Acts 1, Jesus says, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Philip is either fulfilling prophecy or he's just trying to protect his own hide. Or both. That doesn't really tell us why he goes to Samaria. But while he is there, Philip doesn't wait on tables like he is set apart to do. He proclaims the good news. He casts out demons. He heals the lame and the paralyzed. He does the work of the apostles. He's even baptizing Samaritans. News of the gospel spreading in Samaria makes its way back to Jerusalem church. Peter and John decide that they need to go up and see what is taking place in Samaria, to pray with the people there and to bring the Holy Spirit to them. Philip built himself a pretty nice little Christian community in Samaria, and he probably could have stayed there the rest of his life, ministering to the people of Samaria. However, he is led away from Samaria by an angel to the road that leads south from Jerusalem to Gaza. The angel doesn't tell him why he needs to go there. He just says to get up and go towards the south, to the road that leads down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And while he's walking along this road, he meets someone, a eunuch from Ethiopia. Now, this particular eunuch is a high-ranking government official who also happens to be a follower of God. But because he is a eunuch, he is seen as an outsider to the temple. But he's a deeply faithful man. He's traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. It probably took him a week to get there. They were even longer. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and while he was returning home, he was reading out loud a passage from the scroll of Isaiah, what we know as the suffering servant narrative. The spirit compels Philip to go over and jump into this chariot, this perfect stranger. I'm sure the, the, the eunuch is a bit bewildered. Some stranger is jumping into his ride, especially after being in Jerusalem and just being seen as an outcast and an outsider and probably no one ever talking to him. <laughs> Apparently, Philip, though, can add uh, chariot jacking to the list of things they did not teach him in seminary. Oh, Y'all didn't laugh at that joke. No one laughed at that joke at the first service either. <laughs> so Philip's first question to the eunuch is, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch replies by asking, how can I unless someone guides me? The eunuch, who is deeply religious, has never had anyone guide him or walk with him in his faith because of who he is, a eunuch. 
Philip sees the eunuch's desire to grow deeper in his faith, so he jumps aboard the chariot and begins to open the scripture in light of Jesus and the cross event. And during that conversation, the two of them come upon a body of water. The eunuch says, look, behold, here is, a, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? This is a part of the story that I just truly love. Remember, they're in the middle of the desert. Water doesn't just appear out of nowhere. It all just sounds like the perfect coincidence, right? But it's not. Philip is in the middle of nowhere. He meets some random eunuch who is reading the most perfect passage that seems to describe Jesus right down to the, to the letter. And then, then this eunuch wants to know more about Isaiah and what, it, and what this means. And then they come upon a random body of water. You know, I've always had this policy and belief that if someone was to come up to me during worship or after worship or even before worship and say, you know, I want to be baptized today. I'm going to go get a pitcher of water and some chrism and we're going to make this happen, even if it's not in the bulletin. And I know there's some pastors and churches out there that have this massive requirement, amount of requirements in order to be baptized. You need to like go to like a six-week class. You need to meet with the pastor, the deacon. You need to find someone in the congregation to be a sponsor. And then yourself, you need to find two family members to be a sponsor as well, right, in order to receive the sacrament. But how can these churches and pastors reconcile their piety and polity in light of these words in the Ethiopian Union? Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? You know, and, and I think in our, in our Christendom world, I think we often forgot that sometimes the Holy Spirit moves in ways we do not expect. We try to control the Spirit by establishing policies and procedures to bring order to chaos. I mean, that's what the apostles were trying to do when they were facing a problem of tending to the needs of an ever-growing community of believers. The apostles set apart seven men to do this work. But then life happens. Persecution and diaspora of the church. Stephen never got to tend the table in his life. The other five deacons, though they probably did this work, had to adopt to a community which now has to live in hiding in secret. And Philip flees Jerusalem before he ever gets a chance to do the work he was set apart to do in Jerusalem. What I hear the most from this passage today is the need for the church to be flexible. Sometimes the best laid plans are turned on their heads by the world. Sometimes you are led by the Spirit to the middle of nowhere because there is someone who desires to learn more about God and the Lord. Sometimes you're in the middle of the desert and water suddenly appears, making baptism a possibility. Sometimes you're in the middle of a global pandemic and this new technology, which is just starting to become more affordable and accessible to the masses, is made available so that church communities around the world can stay connected, even in the midst of isolation. Sometimes the right person at the right time comes and fills a vacancy that we've long been searching for, someone we never expect. You know, we're never told what happened to the Ethiopian eunuch after he was baptized that day. Tradition holds that that the Ethiopian unit brought the gospel back to his native land and to the continent of Africa. Had Philip not trusted the Spirit all those years ago, millions of people would not have had the chance to hear the good news brought to them by the Ethiopian eunuch. The Spirit moves in ways we can never begin to imagine. Where is the Spirit leading us, leading you today? In this post-resurrection, post-Christendom world that we find ourselves living in, I think we need to take a page out of these early days of the church. The best laid plans that we might try to put in place are sometimes thrown in the air by the world and the spirit. When others try to do us harm, the spirit works through that time to bring good news, even in the midst of bad news. The message of the good news, the message in good news in this passage today is that the spirit will always provide us the tools we need to minister and bring the good news to people, to all people. Ionia Carson. What is the Spirit going to do in you two? People got, not only are we baptizing just two very cute kids, we also just finished baptizing two other very cute kids today, Murphy and Cameron. What an amazing opportunity the Spirit is doing right here in our very midst. Four very cute kids are going to grow up one day and, and still be very cute because their parents are very cute. And... Um, 
but they're going to grow up. And they're going to become the next Philip and Mary of our church. And I know the Spirit is going to work through them and do even greater things than Philip and his comrades once did. And maybe one day when I'm old and feeble and hopefully long, long retired, I might get the chance to come back here one day to that step, lay a hand or two on one of them as they become the church's next deacon or, or pastor. Where is the Spirit leading us today? And what gifts is the Spirit empowering within us to those who are outside the church on the fringes of society? The world presents us with problems. The Spirit is always willing and able to provide us the means, the solution to face these problems today and bring the good news to unlikely places and unlikely people. Let us stand and sing him six to nine.
you may be seated, and I invite you to take those hymnals, you still need them, and turn in the front of your hymnal to page 227, 227 in the very front, little numbers on the bottom of the page, 227, as we baptized two special ones, okay? God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are united with all the baptized in the one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and join in God's mission for the life of the world. Yeah. Elliot and Cheryl, as you bring Ione and Carson... To receive, oh, first let me ask. Yes, called by the Holy Spirit and trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have Ioni and Carson baptized? If so, answer, I do. Yes, I do. Okay. As you bring your children to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live with them among God's faithful people, bring them to the Word of God and the Holy Supper, teach them the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, place in their hands the Holy Scriptures and nurture them in faith and prayer so that your children may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others in the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help your children grow in the Christian faith and life? If so, answer, I do. You're not, you do, good, I'm glad. You're not alone. People of God, do you promise to support Ioni and Carson and pray for them in their new life in Christ? If so, answer, we do. All right. I invite you all together. You may remain seated, but I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? I I renounce them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? I I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? I I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay. All right, here's what we need. Ioni, can you stand on that step for me? And can mommy hold Teddy, because I have an important job for you to do. Come step on up. And Carson, can I have you? Can you hang with me for a little bit? We've got some important work to do, okay? We're going to put some water in here, okay? Can you help me put water in here? Ready? You want to push it? Go ahead. You can pour too, Ioni. Push. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death and raise us to live in you. Push the rest of that in. Go ahead, Ioni. Push it up. Oh, it's so heavy. Look at that. Good job. Thank you. All right. I need your help. Can you put your hands like this? Put your hand like that. One, two, three. Just like that. Perfect. Perfect. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Okay. Good job. Who's going first? (laughs) <laughs> them? They need to remember, too. You know what? On Easter, I put water all over them. It was so much fun. So much fun. 
You want to go first? Okay, I'm going to give Bubba here. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Can you come a little bit closer? Yep, we're going to move it. All right, can you put your hand? I'm going to get you a little right. Put your head down. Here we go, we got it. I baptize you, Ione Alice, in the name of the Father. Uh-huh, and the Son. Oh, we're getting you all wet. And the Holy Spirit. Amen. Get a towel for you, babe. Good job. Boop, boop, boop. We got you all wet. Good job. And your eyes are red. Good job. Red, your brother. You want to hold the towel? So then you can get the spots I missed. I'm sorry, friend. All right. You want to hop on down? And we'll get. Good job. We'll get brother. You want to come? Your turn to get wet. Your turn to get wet. Ready? You want to do it? Do you want to touch the water? Isn't that cool? Go ahead. You can touch the water. Oh, it's warm. It's really nice. Nice. You ready? I'm going to put some water on your head, okay? Ready? I'll do it, okay? Ready? I baptize you, Carson, in the name of the Father and the Son. Whee! And the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Friends, please join me in that spot that says you belong. You belong to Christ in whom you have been baptized. Alleluia. Okay, we have a few more things to do. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. We're just going to lay our hands on your head. Sustain Ione with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Carson, you're amazing. <laughs> Sustain Carson with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. 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 Ione, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Do you like my earrings? They're sparkly. Carson, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Feels funny, huh? All right. Do you want to do that part? You said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. Let us welcome the newly baptized. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. You can blow that candle out, Carson. Go for it, for safety reasons. And we can all clap. Yay! Yay! So we said there were lots of responsibilities. We also promised that we would help. And so we offer you, we'll help you, some gifts, some Bibles, some coloring books, and then you get to take your candle with you. And every year on this date, we light our candle to remember our baptismal anniversary, our birthday. All right. That's such a cool catechism. It has pictures in it. Oh, <gasps> pictures. Or kids and adults that say they get more out of the children's sermon than the yeah. real adults. Sermon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Here, why don't you take that back from me? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very good. All right, we continue then with the prayers of intercession. I invite you to stand as you're able.
Rejoicing that Jesus has risen and that God's love for us has triumphed over our fear of death, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all those in need of the good news. Let us pray. We pray for God's church around the world, for all ministers of the good news, and for the mission of the gospel. Keep all the newly baptized and confirmed in your care. Cleanse our hearts with your word and help us to abide in, your, in you always. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. For the well-being of God's earth, and for all created things, for rivers and lakes, streams and springs, glaciers and oceans. Renew the face of your earth and shower us with your goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. For the nations and for all those in authority, for local, state, and national leaders, for elected representatives at every level, and for international organizations that justice and peace may reign. Lord, in your mercy. For all those in need, for any experiencing homelessness or unemployment, for those fleeing from oppression or seeking asylum, and for all who are ill or suffering today. We pray especially for Dick, Joanne, Diane, Mary, Junior, Joe, John, all those on our prayer list, and all whom we name before you now, either aloud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. For this congregation, for the caring ministries of this church, for all who visit and minister to one another, for all who take communion to homes or care centers, and for all who seek to share your love with the world, Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We pray with thanksgiving for the saints who now rest from their labors. Help us to bear much fruit and to be your disciples. And at the end of our lives, bring us to that heavenly banquet where all the faithful will feast together at your table. We especially remember before you Nancy and Linda. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share a sign of peace with your neighbors as you're comfortable, and then you may be seated.
Please stand as you are able. Let us pray. Risen Christ, you call us to believe in you and to bear good fruit, fruit that will last. May the gifts that we offer to you here today show our love for you. Enable us to be your witnesses in this world for which you gave your life. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. The Lord be with you. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Please be seated. Uh, a word on communion. This is the meal of the baptized, so those baptized Christians are welcome to come forward to receive. Uh, you can receive. We have gluten-free wafers if you need. You'll come to the middle, receive the wafer. Uh, and then come to your side, uh, receive a cup of, with wine or grape juice, and when you're finished, you put it over in the um, baskets on the windowsills. If you would like to come forward for a blessing, that is perfectly fine as well. Just let us know and we will do that. We join together in singing the Agnes Day.
Please stand as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, our good shepherd, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from these gifts of your body and blood to proclaim your goodness and to share your abundant mercy with others. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing together our final hymn, 742. 742. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. As we go out into the world, let us remember our mission. As the people of God, we share Christ's love, grow in faith, and serve others. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.